This is Just Say HIE, the official podcast of the Hope for HIE Foundation. I'm Betsy Pilon, your host, bringing the stories of the HIE community from around the world to you, our listeners. Hope for HIE is a nonprofit organization and the largest collective of HIE families anywhere in the world. And each story across all outcomes has its own version of hope to share. Join us as we explore each unique journey and connection. And our first guest for this um, new initiative through Hope for HIE is Annie Geller, who is the um, current uh, vice president of PR and marketing and Hope for HIE's board of directors and has been serving since, uh, I believe, 2015, Annie, right? Yeah, yeah. It's been a while. (laughs) It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so um, you are actually stepping off the board at the end of Awareness Month, but I thought it would be really fun to bring you on as the first guest because your efforts for building Awareness Month have been, you're you're the reason why we have this and why um, we've been so successful to uh, get the word out and uh, through different initiatives. So I'd love for you to first and foremost, first and foremost, start at the beginning and kind of talk about um, your daughter, Emma, and your HIE story, and then get into a little bit about how you, um, you know, felt uh, either arm wrestled into or just um, compelled to join the board of directors and and build uh, build some some fun things with hope and take the foundation to new places. Absolutely. So um, our Emma was born in 2011 and um, had a rough delivery. So then she had her very first helicopter flight to the children's hospital in our city, um, where she was cooled. And um, they did a great job with helping her um, and really, really saving her life. So we were really grateful for them. And then it was, you know, a wait and see. We don't know what's going to be. But I do remember being in the NICU and them telling us, like, we don't have any other babies here right now with HIE and couldn't even really tell you the last time we had one. So it was kind of like whoa, like, what does that mean? And I don't even know what this is. And like, now it sounds like this super rare thing. So we, you know, got home from the NICU after three weeks and settled into life. And then um, I went Googling because that's what you do, obviously. Um, So started trying to figure out, you know, what is HIE? What does this mean? I know they said it's rare, but is there anybody else that I could talk to that has been through this and who knows how to navigate all of these things that are being thrown at us with specialists and um, trying to figure out childcare and, you know, how are we going to manage therapies and and just all the things. Um, So when I found Hope for HIE, um, the first thing I came across was like a Yahoo member board, um, which is like so old. And so I reached out to like the admin there and was like, you know, I'm dying to connect. I really, really want to talk to other parents. And I think, I mean, it probably took her maybe 12 hours to respond. But in my head at that moment, it was like the longest time ever just waiting. And so then she had directed me to the Facebook group. Um, which at the time was very small, only maybe a couple hundred families. Um, and I don't even think Emma was a year old by then yet and started talking with other families and feeling like, oh my gosh, there's finally some people who get this. Like, I feel like we're not so alone anymore. I feel like I have people that I can, you know, talk to about this, but people who can really help me because they've been here. And that was really huge for us. I felt like mentally and emotionally, that was like a big turning point for us to feel like, you know, we have the support of friends and family and always will have that. But it's different to have that support coming from other people who have been where you are. Um, So, you know, we stayed um, in the Facebook group for a while, watched it grow got to meet lots of people, including Miss Betsy here, um, and um, started seeing more organization come about. And um, 
as soon as I saw that there was, you know, we're turning this into a thing, like we're going to make this into a nonprofit. We're going to like expand this. We're going to make this into more than just a Facebook group. And I, I think I was the one who was harassing you like, Betsy, how do I get involved? Like, this sounds so cool. And oh my gosh, I work in communication. What are the chances? Um, so I started doing some volunteer work and then um, eventually joined the board in um, the marketing type role, which was kind of new for me because I had been on the like newspapering side, but hadn't really done the whole marketing side. So there was a lot of, hey, Betsy, I have a question. Um, but it was really collaborative. And um, then I feel like Things started slowly taking off. And then over the last couple of years, it was like, kapow, and like really took off like a rocket. Um, and just for me, being able to be a part of that has just been, I don't know, just so special to me to be able to watch this organization grow, to watch the number of people that we're reaching grow and grow and how quickly we're reaching them now. I mean, we're reaching families while they're still in the NICU. And I think, gosh, that would have been so cool to have when we were in the NICU. And, you know, it couldn't happen for us, but it can happen for so many others. Um, so that has been awesome. Um, I had a childhood friend that I grew up with whose son was born with HIE. She lives across the country from me now. Um, but she immediately contacted me and like was driving from the hospital where she birthed at to the hospital where her son had been taken to be in the NICU and to undergo cooling therapy. And she was, of course, very scared and very upset, but was like, I know you've been a part of like a group or something, and I just really want to connect. And so immediately got her into like the new to HIE group, and she found support right from the very beginning, which was very critical for her in getting through that journey. Um, so that was like, super special to me. And I think we were we were at the board retreat when that happened too, because I like took the phone call and then ran out into the other room and was like, oh my gosh, you guys. So just like a even more boost of like, this is why we do what we do, which is just super cool. Yeah. I remember that moment in particular um, and just thinking about how ironic and how, I mean, there's just been so many stories like that in our network mm -hmm. and uh, just thinking about, you know, the why of, you know, not only for obviously our own experiences of what has, you know, driven us all to want to give back and grow this and things like that, but it's really those connections. Um, and I thought, you know, just like witnessing that, you know, secondhand and then going, wow, this is, this is exactly why we're doing this is because, you know, we know and care about so many people. And then, when it happens to someone else because of, you know, the incidents and prevalence, um, you know, we get to then have created this space that welcomes people and supports people. And um, they have that connection from the get go. And I mean, and nothing can be, you know, everyone would like an Annie Geller at the beginning of their experience, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I think, you know, that that story always resonates with me mm -hmm. uh, with hearing about that and, you know, even hearing um, her reflection as well. You know, I know um, there was a blog post about both of you and things like that that was written. And um, it's just such a, a different dynamic and I think just a forever, um, forever bond that you will have with her in, in such a unique way. And we're able to be there for her in a way that truly no one else, I'm sure, in her life could be. It's, yeah. it's really amazing. Yeah. It was, it was really meaningful to me um, to be able to be there for her in that moment when she's just getting the news and not sure what is life, what is this going to look like? Um, and being able to tell her like, whatever it looks like, it's going to be okay. You know, things are going to be okay. You guys are going to move forward as a family and you're going to have all of these people backing you and being there for you. Um, and Cole, her son is the cutest little boy now, love seeing him, love seeing how well he's doing. So it's wonderful to, to be able to have that support. That is just so, so amazing. Um, and so let's talk because it's, uh, going to be April and when this <laughs> airs, it will be April Woohoo! and this is going to be our sixth 
HIE Awareness Month. Uh, and this was kind of a, let's, let's talk a little bit about starting HIE Awareness Month, because I think this is kind of a unique thing. We get a lot of questions, too, of, you know, how did this get started and why and, um, you know, what are the goals and all of that. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about that. So, um, you know, and, and I'd love to hear your perspective. I know, you know, my own reflections have been, you know, and my answer is, well, it, it needed to happen and nothing existed before. So let's let's do a thing. Let's make it a thing. And a thing indeed it is. Um, right. It's really... <laughs> It's like a big thing now. It's a big thing, you know? Yeah. So it was, I remember those conversations when we started having them and being like, you know, such a big part of what we were needing at that time and and still need um, was awareness and making people aware of HIE, making people aware of us um, and what we do. So I remember talking about it and being like, well, we should do an awareness month. And it seemed like, at the time, like this pie in the sky idea, like you don't just do an awareness month, you know, but we were like, what you do. And so we just did it, you know, and it was like, yeah, let's do April. April seems like a great month. And, you know, and so we were like, well, let's, let's figure out how to get this out there, you know, and let's develop like a theme and, you know, let's, let's put together a press kit and, you know, try to like get things out to lawmakers for like recognition. And I know in that first year, um, we were still really figuring it all out and being like, okay. And then I guess we could do like t-shirts and like, you know, it was just kind of like ideas here and there and like figuring out how to kind of put those into a really good plan. Um, And it's kind of when I reflect back on that time, you know, we were so unsure about everything, but we were sure that what we were doing was something that we needed to be doing. It was like the, how do you do it that we were trying to figure out? Um, But, you know, we got attention from that first year. Um, And then the second year I felt like we were like, okay, we can do this. We've done this before and, you know, hitting our stride. Um, And now in year six, I mean, it's, you could say it's almost like a well-oiled machine at this point, you know, we're like, okay, let's think of a theme, let's figure out what we want that to look like, let's develop our messaging around that, um, and then let's launch all the things. Um, So I feel like it's definitely much more smooth now than it was, you know, six years ago or whatever, when we were all like, awareness month, what? Okay, let's try it. Um, But I'm so glad we did it because I feel like every year... um, you get people that are like, oh, holy cow, like, I didn't even know this was a thing. But I saw like, my cousin's sister's brother's coworker, you know, shared it on Facebook. And now I have support. And now I know what HIE is. And I know that there is an organization strictly focused on this. Um, And I think it's really cool to see also how far message has carried. Because in the beginning, you know, I feel like, we were hitting the U S and especially hitting like our Midwest folks, you know, really well. Um, but now you see it carrying worldwide and people all over the world are sharing this message and posting their stories and talking about their experience. And it's just so cool to see how far we've been able to go with that from these, you know, really small starts that we had in the very beginning. Yeah, I like to call it spaghetti on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely spaghetti on the wall. It's like, we'll just see, we'll just, we think this is a good idea. We'll right. try this. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, we'll try something else. <laughs> right. We're like, should we do it? Let's do a month. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to take up a whole month of space. We have a lot yeah. to say. There's a lot of, a lot of things to say and a lot of people to, to say them. So. Well, now, and I feel like a month almost isn't enough with all the messaging that we want to put out and all of the families that want to participate and want their stories shared. We like start scheduling and we're like, oh man, why is April so short? You know, like. I know. And now there's, so this, so let's talk about um, this upcoming or I guess when this airs, it'll be in the, you know, in the midst of awareness month, but this year's theme is team hope. And we have had, like you had mentioned before, a huge, just uptick in growth the past couple of years. And so our team that um, originally as we launched was really uh, our board of directors and our community, you know, our worldwide community 
now we have our medical advisory board and our council of advisors and our partners in hope and just all of these incredible different groups that are a part of our um, our organization and our you know awareness efforts and it's just pretty pretty wild to see that growth I mean it's yeah. it's pretty fun to see where we have started and where we are going. Mm -hmm. And I guess because we've talked about this and that there's a theme, is there a specific theme that has resonated the strongest for you over the years? Because we've done now six of them. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you have a favorite. I don't know. I mean, I'm loving the graphics that we have for this year. Oh, they're so freaking cute. Um, and I do like the message I, one of my favorite ones was, was our choose hope campaign. Um, that one just, it just meant a lot to me because, you know, it's a conversation that you and I have had a lot and that we've had a lot as a community that, um, part of your mindset is being able to look at the situation that you're in and still be able to choose hope. Um, you know, we've had conversations about this. Um, you know, my Emma, she has a wheelchair, she has a feeding tube, she has a communication device. And, you know, you look at that from the clinical side and she's labeled as severe. Um, but you've met Emma and that girl is sass and smart and sweet. And, um, you know, there was probably a time a long time ago where I think it was hard for me to choose hope. But at this point, so much of what I see are opportunities for where we can go next. You watch as technology develops. You know, when Emma was, gosh, I think two or three, we tried an eye gaze communication device and it was not working for her. The technology just wasn't ready. Um, and now she has one and she plays games on it. She sits through menus to be able to like tell us what she wants. Um, she, she does all these things with it that wasn't possible seven or eight years ago, but now it is. So what else could be possible five years from now or 10 years from now? And so when I see those things, that is just so much hope for me because I'm like, look at where we could go next, you know? Um, she had a baclofen pump put in last year and she wasn't capable of doing a power chair before, but now it looks like she probably will be able to. So again, advances in technology, advances in her care plan have allowed us to open up more opportunity for her, which is super cool. So when the Choose Hope campaign, that resonated a lot with me because I'm thinking to myself, like, what do I choose hope in every day? Well, here are the different things that we choose hope in because that's what keeps us going. That's what says, what, what keeps you saying, yes, I can do my, you know, 10th appointment this month with a specialist because when we're done with that appointment, we have X, Y, and Z to work towards and we have a new plan to help her be the best Emma that she can be. So that one was really, really huge with me. Yeah, I love that. It's like, I, you know, I think those of us that have been in it for a, for a hot minute <laughs> have seen this, this med tech in particular. It's like, it has to catch up to these kids because, mm -hmm. I mean, and it is amazing to see. Um, and, you know, communication in particular is an area of focus that I know we've talked about too with, um, with the foundation. Um, and really trying to turn the tide of, and I, you know, I think we've seen a shift and we've started to see a bigger shift where, you know, for the longest time, the first, you know, couple of years for every new family was like, are they meeting their physical milestones? Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then what? We're just going to keep trying to do all the things to try to have them meet physical milestones. Right. And mm -hmm. then meanwhile, you know, especially for our kids that, um, you know, might, you know, be delayed in gross motor mm -hmm. or have, you know, um, more of those difficulties or, you know, not be able to communicate verbally, um, behaviors are exacerbated because they're trying to communicate and they have no way to communicate. So, and as soon as you get them a way to communicate, things get better because they have a voice and they can be heard through their own means. Um, and I love, you know, I think, like Emma's such a great story because of that, like, and to see her, you know, really, um, you know, really grow and, and, you know, 
and develop and have her voice and, you know, to see how many kids should and, and need that. Mm-hmm. And the earlier, the better. So I think that, you know, continues to be when we talk about things to, you know, advocate for and to, you know, the exciting things about, um, you know, where things are for our kids. I know we've said this a bunch of times too. If you're going to have a child born and have a disability, now is about one of the best times in history to to have that because you have access to so many things than you would have all otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I yeah. think that you know that is such a, a wonderful point to bring up because you know it, I'm excited to see what where things are in ten years. I mean, mm-hmm. it's gonna be it's gonna be a total game changer. You know, um, I'll touch on something personal with me real quick, but I, I feel similar where you know Max just um, started having seizures right before. Um, Christmas this past year. And he has tonic clonics. Those are the two that he's had, his two seizures that he's had before he got on a medication for it. And um, we got a seizure monitor that he wears as a wristwatch and it detected the second seizure. It woke us up at 530 in the morning. You know, it's like, when is that? I mean, that to me is astounding. Oh yeah, and that technology, you know, is, is a fairly new technology. And I just think about all the other things with neuro that is going to continue to move forward, you know, because that, I mean, that is a huge peace of mind for the middle of the night. And to think about again, like what other things are there, you Mm -hmm. know, moving forward that can help Um, whether it's, you know, there's, there's DBS, deep brain stimulation. There's like you said, the baclofen pump, there's just all sorts of different things that, that can help improve quality of life, which is, you know, and, and living, living each child's best life, as we like to say too, you know? So I love, I love hearing about that. And I think that is one point in particular with communication that is so critical for families to hear, um, especially, you know, those that, you know, the first couple of years going, "Mm, yep, this is, you know, this is going to be a different journey than I anticipated. And how can I get my kid communicating? So Mm -hmm. important. Such a great point to bring up. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we've become like a baclofen pump spokesman since Emma got hers because I've had several families that have reached out and talked to us about it. And then I've been like messaging with them while they're like getting through surgery and recovery. And, um, but you know, it's not right for every kid, but I think speaking of technological advances, you know, when this option was first brought to us probably five years ago, at the time Emma was too small anyway, but I was also concerned about, you know, the failure rate and what improvements are being made to make sure that this is a device that works. And so um, when we had our our trial, which, you know, they do to see if it's going to work for them, they put the baclofen into their spine and kind of a quick procedure to see if it's going to make a difference, which woo, big difference for Emma. And we were so excited. But I talked to the rep from the company um, and he had said, you know, here's like three things that we've improved upon in the last year to two years that have significantly decreased our failure rate of the pump. And so knowing those things made me feel a lot better going into that surgery. Um, But it's, you know, it's the technology that is like constantly moving, you know, and they're starting to develop things now with um, the newer iPads where they have eye gaze communication and you can get apps that will allow your child to use that to speak. And two years ago, that was not a thing, but, but Apple is like constantly improving it to try to make it work for everyone. So I think especially as you see this technology develop, we're also going to see it become um, more feasible for families to get their hands on things because some of these devices, as we all know, are very expensive and can be hard to get. It can be based on where you live, but if they develop something like a tablet that can do it, it is so much easier for families to get. So I get excited when I see those advances happening and think about how great it's going to be for our community as it continues happening. Yeah, that's so great. I totally agree. It's just, again, you know, tech has come so far in the past few years and it's just so exciting to see where it's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as you are uh, kind of sunsetting on the board of directors, (laughs) I would love to get your reflections on, you know, you talked a little bit about it in the beginning of our chat, but you know, what other things do you want to, you know, I guess, you've obviously left a humongous imprint on the board of directors um, and, and the foundation through all of the incredible work you've done to, I mean, you've, let's see here, you've 
completely overhauled and relaunched our website. <laughs> you um, have written over a hundred blog posts. You have, you know, like goodness knows, put into layout hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of family spotlights between HIA Awareness Month and the holiday campaign that we've done every year. Oh my goodness. Are you like Canva out? What are you going to do with your life? <laughs> no, Canva has changed my life. I love Canva. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I don't, it's just, I think one of the things that I really like to look back on when I look at how far we've come is seeing our numbers and our reach. Um, cause those are, are huge to me. Like I think about, you know, like the first time we did one of those maps of like where everybody is was so much more like, you know, kind of centered into a little area. And now it's, it's grown out so far, um, which is so cool. Um, but like, I've watched us really kind of grow our footing of who we are and what it is that we want to do. Um, really honing in on our mission and our vision and who it is that we serve. Um, and I think seeing the possibilities that are out there. So, you know, five years ago, I don't think that we would have ever thought that me and you would have co-written a chapter for a book with, you know, medical people like, Holy cow, like we have a seat at the table now. We have made it more, I guess, more of a thing, more of a necessity to invite parents to the table to get their voice out there um, so that practitioners can serve families in the best way. And I think maybe there was hesitation on our part in the beginning because we didn't necessarily think that we should have a seat at the table. You know, I don't have MD behind my name. Um, I have a, you know, BA in journalism. So it's like, you just don't really feel like, should I be there? Should they listen to me? But I think that we have shown that the expertise that we have is absolutely invaluable to so many things that they're doing from um, developing, you know, better devices for testing to medications to just communicating between medical professionals and parents, which is huge. We have learned that so much, um, not just from our experiences, but from experiences all over. And this is something that we're learning that the practitioners want to know these things. They want to serve families in the best way that they can. They want to provide that best care. But how do they know how to do that if nobody steps up and says, hey, I'm a parent. Like, I, I think I have a pretty good idea of how you should treat, you know, me and my kid. Um, so I think that seeing those things branch out and grow and seeing us dive into some of those other areas where we didn't really know we had a place and finding that we do have a pretty important place at the table has been just so cool to watch. Um, and I think that Communication is definitely a big part of that because we're constantly figuring out how to get our message out to these other people, to these other sides, to these other groups that need to know who we are. Um, and, and seeing that happen has really been one of like the most exciting things for me, um, for being a part of Hope for HIE. Um, and I really get really jazzed about it and want to see that continue to happen. And like, I'm, constantly mentioning us to Emma's medical providers. Like when we're talking, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm part of this nonprofit organization called Hope for HIE and here's the website and you just might want to check it out, you know, to learn a little bit more. And they're very receptive. They want to hear about it. So that's really cool to me and an area that I really like to see us grow in. Yeah, it's been pretty amazing the past two years. And I mean, yeah, I just, you know, I think the the chapter that you mentioned, um, which I'm so excited when it gets, for it to get published and to share it with our community and out there, um, it has been such a, I think a fantastic example of what is possible when you can come together. And I'm also just constantly impressed with how many people care about our community and how many. Um, physicians and other clinicians, um, you know, really are taking it seriously of how to help our kids and help our families from the beginning through the continuum of, you know, different outcomes and different needs that our families have. 
And the more that they're aware of that spectrum and the different nuances of, you know, different ways that HIE can impact a family, uh, the, the more that they are able to really look at this of how we can best serve families together. And that has been such a fun thing to see and such a really remarkable thing to see. Um, and yeah, just reflecting on that, you know, hearing you, you know, just talk about how, yeah, five years ago, we probably never would have thought that we, we would, we had hoped that we would start to be at, you know, this table, but we're also creating a table. And I think that has been, you know, just one of the things that you've been such um, a key part in as well of, you know, the efforts that you've put together have led to that, have, you know, directly led to these discussions and people being able to find us and and really take a second look about how we can come together um, to, you know, to move things forward for our community. Um, and that that's, I'm just so excited to see what else, you know, moves forward. And I'm so excited about that chapter. So let's talk about that a little bit too. So this is all about supporting HIE families. I think the the focus is about in the NICU, but we talk about um, some different touch points. And this actually was how one of our newest graphics uh, and educational pieces came about, too, with the HIE NICU experience. And then we kind of dived into um, disparity and language use about NICU and just, you know, all sorts of different ways <laughs> that things can still be improved. So uh, talk a little bit more about the chapter because... We got this opportunity. I'll tee it up, and then I want to hear your experience. We um, we got an opportunity through the Newborn Brain Society, which um, we are, you know, we I sit on the board of directors for, and we are working with so many of the people uh, that are involved with NBS, and um, and it's a it's a society that is uh, multidisciplinary, um, and you know is is really heavy on. Uh, on the neonatal neuro um, critical care teams. So whether that's a pediatric neurologist, neonatologist, nurses, um, other allied health professionals, and then we're building a parent task force, which is really exciting over there as well. Um, and we were kind of the first families, um, first parent organization to um, you know work with them. And so they approached us saying, hey, would you be able to co-write a chapter? Um, we're talking about, uh, you know, in particular, you know, therapeutic hypothermia and HIE in this, you know, spe- you know specific uh, edition of, um, of a journal and a chapter. We'd love to have you focus and co-write with two other authors. So we were co-writing with Dr. Monica Lemon and Dr. Alexa Craig and talk about that experience. I'd love to hear more from your perspective. So I I thought that was super cool that they were inviting us to be a part of it. Also a little bit terrifying because I was like, whoa, I don't know if I'm ready for this kind of writing, but um, they were great to work with. And, you know, we kind of started with like a brainstorming session of like really talking about what was the NICU experience like for you as a parent? And, you know, we talked about the different like stages that you have with your NICU experience, you know, so you've got like the birth or the injury event happening and just the, the complete shock that you're in, the totally not understanding what's happening. It's, it's like a mindset all on its own, um, you know, and really trying to help people understand like what it feels like to be, you know, in that moment of trying to figure all of this out. Um, Just trying to even come to grips with like what just happened. Um, So, you know, we kind of talked about that. We talked about, um, you know, like MRI day being like a big thing, which I have found, and I think you have found too, that this has been like a shock to medical professionals that this is like a day that is stuck in our brains. And it absolutely is. I think you talk to like any HIE parent and they're like, oh, I remember MRI day. I remember that very clearly. I still remember it very clearly and not even really understanding like what, what truly an MRI even was, you know, like, what are we going to find out from this? And like, what is this really going to show to us? And, um, you know, really trying to 
process these results that they're giving you that for many of us is your very first experience with anything medical besides like, I think I might have strep, you know, like might've broke my arm, you know, like it's not something that most of us have very much experience with. And then they start using all these terms that you totally don't understand. You're still trying, trying to process what happened maybe two days ago. Um, and so it's it's like a whole thing on its own, which I think is enlightening for medical professionals to learn these mindsets that you're in. Um, you know, and then you get to the point of like, okay, well, we have these results. Let's figure out what our, our treatment plan is and let's figure out moving forward and how do we, you know, do these things of like getting you ready to go home and like what does all of this mean? You know, and that's kind of like a whole a whole thing there. And and that can be, who knows, that can be several days, it can still be several weeks, you know, the time frame is, is really going to be different. And that's when, you know, more support is going to be needed, more understanding of like, trying to put all of these pieces together of what happened when the injury happened? What did these test results show? And what does that mean for my child and my life? Um, and what what are we going to do to try to even get home? Um, and then there is, okay, we're home now. <laughs> I don't have the beeping monitors of the NICU. I could sleep, but I don't know my constant, you know, heart rate and respiration rate and blood pressure of my child. So I'm totally freaking out right now. So it's like breaking it into those things. Um, one makes it really relatable to families um, because I think everybody remembers those stages that they went through. But I think it also really helps break down to the medical professionals that really do want to help. They really do want to help families of how to be um, sensitive to what people are going through. Why you might have just explained, you know, this test result to somebody two hours ago, and now they have questions and are still not understanding because of all those mindsets. So I think helping people understand the emotions and um, the mindset that people are in and the absolute stress and trauma that the situation brings um, will only help with, with, with treatment and care given to those families. Um, you know, and we did to help with this and to help kind of back up the claims that we were making, we did a survey of our community. Um, and I think that was extremely telling. And one of the big things that we saw was families talking about the communication side and what they thought could have improved there. And that was a lot of different things. Um, I think people had a lot of experiences, you know, some of them as simple as like, I just wanted some someone to sit down face to face with me and talk with me. But some of what we were seeing was, I didn't even know what HIE was. Nobody told me. HIE. And then I got home and I read a, our discharge paperwork and I see this thing on there. And I'm like, if I would have known that was there, I would have asked so many different questions. Um, so I think that really identified something for us too, to be able to help people understand that this diagnosis needs to be named, it needs to be explained. And we have to be able to give this information to people so that they are armed with that, with trying to move forward and figuring out their next steps. And I think that that was really eye-opening for us to really see that. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, to take it back to this being the first episode of Just Say H-I-E or Just Say Hi, it is actually a double entendre quite intentionally because we do know that this is a gap and we want people to just say the diagnosis. It is absolutely the worst for parents to find it on a discharge paper, Google it, find an entire support community for it, and then go, why wasn't that told to us? This could have helped me so much. And it has then exacerbated pain. It has broken trust. And that is the last thing that anyone wants. It's the last thing that the medical teams want. It's the last thing that the parents want. So let's improve it and just say HIE. <laughs> I totally agree. And I think one of the things that we talked about as we were working through the tone of that paper and the text of that paper was really trying to talk about how important it is to form this trusting relationship, you know, with compassion and empathy and all of those things right from the very beginning with your medical team, because that is going to impact 
your care plan and your relationship and all of those things for many, many years to come. If you start off with a negative experience in the NICU, that really shapes the way that you feel about your medical community and your medical care team for a long time going forward. So if we can spend a little bit of time up front doing a better job with that education and trying to really make that communication as strong as it can be, think about how much of a difference that will make for people going forward on this journey to try to really feel like they have trust in their medical professionals and they have people who really care about what is going on with their kid. Um, because that that is so essential to that really, I mean, to any relationship, but also to that relationship. Absolutely. And that's, you know, another reason why we have the theme of Team Hope, because people have to learn and it's not, it doesn't happen naturally for most people to learn how to build their teams and to build these positive, productive relationships, especially if you prior, like you said, have had minimal medical interface, either, you know, like just your own primary care of like one checkup a year or every few years. Um, you know, it's just a whole different thing to, you know, come together and try to have this, you know, team built around your family and your child of how to help them, you know, maximize their um, unique potential. Well, thank you for sharing that. That is, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to when it's published. It's going to be really hopefully impactful for, you know, all the people that we hope that uh, can can work through that um, and and really take it to heart. Some of the, the key points that we are uh, that we've all come up with and with the help of our community. And so my I think my final question for you um, during this is what's next? What's next for you, Annie Geller? <laughs> oh, Lord, I don't even know. Um, you know, I have to say. Um, my work with Hope for HIE kind of led me um, in a, another direction in my career. Um, so I went into like communications and marketing, which hadn't really been my path before, but had been kind of where I was wanting to go. Um, so that it, it kind of opened up new things for me. So um, started a new job in January with the State Department of Correction, which I'm liking and is fun and really interesting. Um, But I don't know, you know, I feel like I'm not going to be able to be like, I can't be around Hope for HIE. Like, I'm not going to be able to stay away. I'm going to be still like stalking you guys and trying to see what I can do to help. Um, You know, I feel like just being able to be a part of like some of these cool projects where like I can use some of my writing experience to help or, or things along those lines. I would love to see that happen. Um, and then also preparing myself for Emma to eventually be in middle school in like two years, middle school. I can't even believe it. Um, so, you know, going on that path of, of how do we continue to break down the barriers for our kiddo and um, making sure that she has everything she needs to be as successful as she is going to be. Um, And yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I'm like, what is next for me? I'm not sure. (laughs) Well, um, you know, I, I will say this endlessly, but, you know, thank you for everything that you have done for Hope to grow it to where it is, um, for the friendship, for all of the incredible um, ups and downs and all arounds that we've gone through as we've um, grown this beast. <laughs> 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 and um, and you have definitely made a lot of spaghetti stick <laughs> and made a huge impact and hope would not be what it is today without your incredible, incredible talents that you have lended to the organization to get it where it is today. So thank you, Annie, from um, everyone at Hope and everyone that's going to find Hope that they'll find it because of you, which is pretty amazing. So it's a beautiful legacy to leave for um, for your time on the board. And it has been um, an absolute honor um, to 
uh, serve with you on this journey and um, watch Emma grow and watch you grow in your own journey as parent as we've um, as we've traveled this. Um, so thank you so much for coming on yeah. um, and being the first guest of, uh, <laughs> of the new podcast to kick it off. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited about it and um, have really, really cherished the things that we have done over these last several years um, with hope. And I'm just so thrilled about the progress that has been made and so excited to see what's going to be coming. Um, gosh, look at where we are now. We look at where we were, you know, two years ago, who knows what's two years from now. So I'm just so excited to see it. Wonderful. All right, Annie. Well, thank you so much. And we will catch you in your new adventures and, and see you around the block, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Annie. We will talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for HIE's official podcast, Just Say HIE. If you have a story you'd like to share, be sure to keep in touch. Learn more about the work we do and sign up for our newsletter on our website at hopeforhie.org slash justsayhie. We look forward to connecting with you soon, and thanks for listening.